Antarctica. It's minus 40 degrees, and these teachers are undertaking science experiments that can't be done anywhere else on the planet. Antarctica is one of the most isolated, uninhabited places on the globe. But it's this harshness that makes it so special, not just to do scientific experiments, but as a place of pristine beauty. However, to keep it like this, the behavior of the rest of the world over the next few decades is likely to be the key determinant of what happens to this vast continent. There is only one Antarctica, and it is rapidly changing due to human influences such as scientific research, tourism, and most notably, global climate change. This program looks at Antarctica, its history, and some of the issues putting pressure on this most unique of places. Most of Antarctica is frozen all the time, with a permanent ice sheet covering it. Temperatures can get as low as minus 80 degrees centigrade. Temperatures such as these do present certain challenges, but they don't stop people from coming. This plane is carrying four teachers from Britain. They're coming as part of an organized expedition to do science projects on the ice. Oh, it's absolutely incredible. Just stepping off the plane, see the mountains behind, and then just that way, just space, as far as you can see. They have guides, all the food they need, and specialized equipment and tents. However, it was only recently that expeditions like this became possible. Antarctica was only discovered in 1820, and it wasn't until the early 20th century that people managed to reach the South Pole. Even then it wasn't easy. The conditions made it brutal, and more than one expedition ended in disaster, the most famous being that of Captain Scott in 1912, who reached the South Pole only to perish on the way home. Even today, Antarctica is a hard place to get to, and only a few thousand people a year visit. Because it has never been colonized by man, there are no natives to Antarctica. This means that it is not a country itself, has no government, and therefore no way of controlling what happens there. During the 1950s, as more people traveled to Antarctica, countries, including Britain, tried to claim it for themselves. So, the Antarctic Treaty was drawn up. First of all, the treaty says that the Antarctic is a demilitarized zone. It is also the world's first nuclear-free zone. It places particular emphasis on scientific collaboration. It says that the territorial claims to the Antarctic are considered suspended for the duration of the treaty. The treaty also says that information must be freely exchanged. And finally, the treaty says that it's open to signatory by any other United Nations member state. Since its implementation in 1961, the treaty is generally considered to be very successful. Charles Swithinbank was one of the first people to work in Antarctica and remembers the treaty being drawn up. It is a wonderful document. It was the first big arms control treaty in the world, it bans nuclear weapons, signed by all the major powers. For a country to be an active part of the treaty, they have to have a scientific research station there. And Antarctica has always been a very valuable place to do science. The British Antarctic Survey is funded by the taxpayer to carry out research in Antarctica. The British Antarctic Survey, or BAS as we, we call it, is a scientific organisation. Roughly a couple of hundred um, scientists work for, for BAS. Um, and they're people that might be based permanently in Cambridge, and then scientists who work full-time in the Antarctic itself. The reason organisations like the British Antarctic Survey have been set up is because Antarctica is a unique scientific laboratory. Antarctica is a really wonderful place for science, partly because it's so isolated, it's a, a very pristine environment, 
so we can be fairly confident that the measurements we make aren't contaminated by any of the pollutants that you might find here in the Northern Hemisphere. Jonathan Shanklin and his Bass colleagues showed just how important Antarctica is for science when they used this device to help discover a massive hole in the ozone layer in the atmosphere above Antarctica. Since the ozone hole was discovered in 1985, a scientific consensus has formed that ozone layer depletion is caused by man-made gases such as chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, released by household items such as refrigerators and deodorants. One of the things about the ozone hole was how quickly it happened. And that's a warning to us that if we keep putting um, polluting substances or extracting materials from the, the, the planet, um, we may make changes that we're not expecting. There's pretty good agreement that uh, this was caused by industrial pollution that we put into the air. And uh, from that point of view, it was a wake-up call. Despite the importance of discoveries made by research, there is controversy surrounding the ethics of science in Antarctica. One of the views I think that has emerged over the last five decades is that science has to think far more carefully about its environmental impact. For the first two or three decades of the treaty's existence, the environmental impact of science wasn't considered terribly important. If it had an environmental cost, well, so be it. The Antarctic is a very large place and scientists are only found in a limited uh, number of areas. That's changed. One example of the importance of considering the environmental impact when doing science in Antarctica is research on a lake underneath the ice called Lake Vostok. The Antarctic ice sheet has a number of areas where we know there's liquid water at the base. We think they're freshwater lakes and it's thought that there might even be organisms in the lake. We can't be certain and so they're thing is, can we drill into that lake safely without polluting it? The scientists are very keen to see what life is down there. However, they are worried that the drilling required might allow bacteria and dirt from the surface to penetrate and contaminate the subglacial lakes. To try and prevent this, the Antarctic Treaty demands that all environmental impacts of science be assessed before research can begin. It's, if you like, part of our responsibility towards all living things that they all have a right to existence. Sometimes that constrains what science we can do and we, we have to do assessments of the impact of our science on the environment and if the impact is too great then that science can't be done. As the amount of science taking place in Antarctica increases in the coming years, this argument is likely to arise more and more. Despite the efforts of the treaty and the scientists, there are a number of pressures on Antarctica which are increasingly threatening this delicate continent. The first pressure is the sheer number of people visiting people can now pay for a holiday there. They can take a boat to the coast to look at the wildlife and icebergs, or they can fly onto the ice and climb mountains or visit the South Pole. A holiday like this isn't cheap, typically costing around 20,000 pounds, but the number of people visiting Antarctica is rising. One company that runs trips there has a base 500 miles from the South Pole and it's becoming an increasingly popular destination. It seems to be a rising number. We got um, 320 this year. This isn't a, a Scott or Shackleton type expedition anymore. There's no reason why people shouldn't come here and pit their wits against it. However, many people question whether trips such as this should be run. Well, I think there are a number of fears. And I, um, one is, for example, what if certain popular destinations on the Antarctic Peninsula show evidence of environmental damage. Can the environment cope with more tourists? And also, I suppose, is this the kind of vision we have of the Antarctic, 
where it becomes a sort of fantasy playground for rich, possibly even stupid people uh, to get up to all kinds of endeavours. This argument is countered by tourism's many supporters. To actually come to Antarctica, many people appreciate it and because they've come they really can see it in perspective and there's a lot of drive, environmental drive, by, by the tourists coming here. I don't think we're going to get swamped like many, many places in the world with tourism, but I think it's important that they, they spread the word of what a fantastic uh, continent it is. As well as fears about the development of tourism, there is another pressure which simply wasn't considered in the original 1961 treaty. When the Antarctic Treaty was uh, signed, uh, there was no mention of minerals and the possibility of mineral exploration, and there was no mention of the environment. And what we've seen, of course, in the last 30 or 40 years, is growing oil and natural gas exploitation in the Arctic. So some will say, if it's possible in the Arctic, might it be possible in the Antarctic? The fear is that, as climate change occurs, it's likely that more rock could become exposed as the ice melts, enabling people to get drilling rigs in. My fear is, though, in 50, 60 years time, the debate over mining in the Antarctic might not seem as preposterous as it seems now. As well as the threat from tourism and mining, there is the third man-made pressure on Antarctica that could be devastating. Global climate change. Scientists who work in the Antarctic are saying that there's a real issue regarding ice cap stability. And the polar regions, in some senses, bear the brunt of human-induced global climate change. Even though scientists are dismayed by the potential impacts on the environment, they believe they can use what's happening to Antarctica to help stimulate action on climate change. You can see clearly this change. Uh, it helps to illustrate the, the potential for, to politicians. You need something on the ground that people can see. So, with challenges from climate change, mining and tourism, in the future, will Antarctica still be a place that people like these can come and do science experiments? With the help of the Antarctic Treaty, many people think it can. We pray above all that the provisions of the treaty in terms of disarmament and no military activities will continue because that has been the secret of our success these last 50 years. This framework that maintains Antarctica as a continent for science should um, continue for the, the foreseeable future and that means that we should learn more and more about our planet. If the world continues to depend on oil and natural gas and if, for example, global climate change is making the Antarctic more accessible rather than less, then there's a real danger, I think, that people might look to the Antarctic and think to themselves, I wonder if there's oil there, natural gas, and it may well be a case that in a hundred years' time the Antarctic becomes uh, a site of conflict.